Welcome everyone. This is uh, it's Mark Davidson. I'm serving as the executive director for uh, Voices in Voices for Justice in Palestine. Uh, we are a, a new organization. We've just merged between uh, two predecessor organizations, two um, social justice nonprofits, Coalition for Peace with Justice, and Abrahamic Initiative on the Middle East, and. We are very excited to welcome you to our um, webinar this evening on perspectives on the one state. Where do we go from here? We're very delighted to have two outstanding presenters in Peter Beinart and Youssef Monayer. Um, I'll say a, a word or two about uh, the topic and, and introduce them in just a minute. But first, let me introduce um, Sanjita Ahmed, who is our communications and operations manager, and she'll give you a few words about our procedure for tonight. Sanjita. Hi everyone, my name is Sanjita Ahmed. Um, as Mark said, I'm the Operations and Communications Manager for Voices and Justice for Palestine. Um, I'm just gonna be handling sort of the technical and logistical side of things. Um, so as you all know, this is a webinar, so we're not gonna have any audio or video for the attendees, um, but the way you can engage is through the chat. So if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat and then we'll have people reviewing them and then select them um, to answer using the last 30 minutes. So we'll hopefully get to um, several of your questions um, and just make sure that to make your questions as um, brief as possible so that we can get to as many questions as possible. Um, the webinar will be recorded and it'll be available later um, on our website, our Facebook and social media, um, and I'll send it all to you as well. Um, and the last thing is at the very end, there's a very quick survey. It's literally one question. I just want you to sort of check um, how you found out about the webinar um, to make it easier on our end to do future publicity work. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to our amazing speakers. Okay, hey, um, folks, we're welcome. We're, we're so glad to have you with us. Let me say just a few words about the one state. Um, the conversation about a just and sustainable peace in Palestine, Israel is shifting in new and exciting ways. Uh, the two state solution, which was the reigning orthodoxy for decades, is widely recognized to have collapsed. Several people and several groups still cling to it and believe it may still be viable, but Generally, the, uh, the consensus among a, a growing number of scholars and activists is that it's time to move on to another solution. Uh, in current political discourse, then, there is renewed interest in the one state, um, uh, a binational democracy between the river and the sea with freedom, security, and equal rights for all of its citizens. Uh, Gideon Levy, uh, describes it this way. He says, the fate of all the human beings living between the river and the sea is determined in the government buildings in Jerusalem and the security buildings in Tel Aviv. The only struggle that remains to be carried out now is the struggle for equal rights for all. And Ian Lustig in his um, uh, book, Paradigm Lost, describes it this way. He said, there is today one and only one state ruling the territory between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, and its name is Israel. So the question for us, and which we're gonna explore in some depth in this webinar, is what does the one state mean? What does it pretend for the future? What are the challenges and promises of the, the one state solution? And to help us with that tonight, we have two outstanding speakers. Um, let me introduce them to you. Peter Beinert is professor of journalism and political science at the City University of New York. He's also a contributor to The Atlantic, a CNN political commentator, editor at large of Jewish Currents, and a non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. His third book, The Crisis of Zionism, published in 2012, chronicled the growth of disaffection with Israel among young American Jews. Beinart has written for the New York Times and numerous national and international newspapers, magazines, and journals. Mr. Beinart is a graduate of Yale University with graduate study at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. His recent article in Jewish Currents, Yavna, a Jewish case for equality in Israel-Palestine, and his op-ed in the New York Times announcing his abandonment of the two-state solution as morally indefensible have been much discussed. 
Youssef Munayir is a Palestinian American writer and scholar. He's a non-resident fellow at Arab Center, Washington, DC, where he writes on Israel-Palestine. Formerly, he served as executive director of the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights and is a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Palestine Studies. Some of his published articles can be found in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, The Nation, Foreign Policy, Journal of Palestinian St or Palestine Studies, Middle East Policy, and others. The frequently consulted source for Palestinian perspectives on wide-ranging developments in Israel-Palestine. Dr. Monayer holds a PhD in International Relations and Comparative Politics from the University of Maryland. So a warm welcome to both of our speakers. We're so glad you're here. And we're gonna start by uh, asking each of you to give us a kind of a general overview of what you mean by the one state and why you advocate for it. What is, why is it that this is your position and why you hold it? And we'll start, um, I'd like to start with you, Youssef, on this. So your thoughts about the one state in general. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Mark and uh, Sanjita, uh, for um, you know having us uh, for this uh, conversation and for everybody in the community in uh, North Carolina, where we have uh, many friends among the committed activists for peace and justice there. I hope uh, everybody uh, tuning in is doing as best as possible during these circumstances, and uh, one day we'll be able to have events in person again and see each other in person again. Uh, so thank you for, for putting this conversation together. Um, so in, in regards to your question, the, the, the way that I see it um, is that, first of all, we talk about a one state solution, right? Um, and, and what is the solution if not an answer to a problem? And for, for me, when we talk about the one state solution, I always depart from the point of um, thinking about how it addresses the problem. Uh, and to have that conversation, we have to have some sort of shared consensus about what the problem is. And so for me, it's always been fairly straightforward to, to, to reach this conclusion about a single state with equal rights because of how I understand the problem, what I understand the problem. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, and I uh, think from the perspective of, of many other Palestinians and surely others beyond Palestinians as well, um, the, the problem is not one of contested national movements um, or uh, one of deeply rooted ancient religious hatreds or whatever, whatever other uh, you know, nonsense we might often hear this uh, reduced to. Um, but rather a, a, a matter of settler colonialism. Um, and there is, you know, a, a national movement in, in the Zionist movement that uh, ultimately established a, a, an ethno-nationalist state uh, and in many ways was a nationalist movement, remains a nationalist movement, but it cannot be divorced from the settler colonialist origins of the movement and in fact the um, structures and processes of settler colonialism which were uh, established by the Zionists over a century ago continued very much on a um, uninterrupted historical trajectory uh, to, to the point that we are today. Um, and when one views the problem through the lens of settler colonialism it becomes Far, um, far clearer to see why a single state with equal rights um, uh, is the most appropriate solution for the problem. Um, and so along with addressing the problem as I see it, um, you know, the, the one state solution also, uh, and this is related to, to, to the settler colonialism uh, prism, addresses the largest possible number of stakeholders in the issue. Uh, and so when one thinks about, for example, the conventional uh, two-state solution, as we've often um, you know, uh, heard it discussed by diplomats and, and, and officials and so on, 
the, the vision is basically one of a Israeli state and a Palestinian state, state, you know, perhaps in parentheses, at best case, it is uh, a, a, an entity with unequal sovereignty to the Israeli state. Um, and that uh, may in some ways address Palestinian stakeholders um, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip who continue to live under Israeli military occupation, um, but it doesn't answer questions for Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, it doesn't answer questions for Palestinian refugees who are never seriously dealt with uh, in the two-state framework uh, and are the single largest number of Palestinian stakeholders uh, and, and, and really the center of the Palestinian issue. Um, and, and so, you know, from my perspective, a one-state solution addresses all of these stakeholders as well as uh, Israelis on different sides of uh, the Green Line and can incorporate both the rights and interests of all of those communities within the territory and outside of the territory that have a connection or claim to land there. Uh, for that reason, I think it is um, far more uh, of a, a serious uh, attempt at trying to resolve the problem uh, than the, the two state. Um, the last that, that uh, uh, reason that I will give here, I'm sure we'll have plenty more to discuss later on this, um, is in my view, one state continues to be a far more practical outcome uh, than a, 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 a solution of partition. Um, for, for one, for the reason that, uh, Mark, you mentioned in your introduction, I can't remember who you were quoting, but there, there continues to be one state that is dominating this territory today, a singular state. It is the Israeli state. It rules over the entirety of the territory, um, uh, albeit in, in different ways uh, and with different relationships to the Palestinians there. Um, uh, but nonetheless, um, there is, is, is one ultimate entity that is in control um, uh, as a state within this space. That's the reality that exists today. And, you know, I also think it's important to point out that historically, that's often how it's been. Uh, when one thinks about the history of this territory, you have to go back a really, really, really long way in history. Uh, to find a time when this territory was divided up uh, and not under a common rule, whoever it was, from the Romans to the Byzantines to the Umayyads to the Mamluks to the Ottomans to the whatever, right? Um, you know, uh, Haifa and Nablus were never separated throughout history, you know? Uh, Lid and Jericho were never separated throughout history, right? This is a territory that historically these communities, these towns, these cities uh, have uh, been within the same geographic orbit, right? Uh, and, and undivided for a very, very long, long time. And for that reason, uh, there are all sorts of logistical, geographic, economic practicalities that have developed as a result of that, that both relate to land and people uh, that, that make keeping this all under a, a single entity far more practical uh, than dividing it. And there are many, many reasons why we could, we could go into the impracticality uh, of, uh, uh, of division. Uh, but uh, those for me are sort of the three uh, main reasons. Uh, it addresses the problem as I see it. It addresses the largest number of stakeholders and it remains a more practical uh, outcome. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, Peter, your thoughts about uh, one state uh, in your thinking these days and um, why it's important from your perspective? Sure. And again, thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, let me start maybe where, where Yusuf did um, on the question of settler colonialism. Um, um, because I, I think I have a slightly different perspective than him. I, on, on the question of, of Zionism as settler colonialism, I would say something like yes, but, or maybe yes, and, which is to say there's no question that Zionism has settler colonial features. You don't have to read Palestinian writing even to, to know that. You can read Zionist writing. The, 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 the colonialism was not a dirty word. 
for, for, for many Zionists in the, early, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and of course, the Zionist movement gained the support of powerful elements in Europe, and it had a discourse about modernization, about progress, indeed, even about replacement that is common to other settler colonial movements. But I think it's also um, uh, important to, to, to foreground, it's important to me to foreground, um, that this was also a movement of Jews who, uh, who felt very deeply, um, and indeed is deeply written, written into our, engraved into our tradition, uh, uh, a, a, a connection to this land. Um, there's any, even the most superficial familiarity with Jewish religious tradition shows how central that is. And secondly, that this was also a movement of people who felt starting in the late 19th century and with increasing alarm into the middle of the 20th century, that, um, that they were in grave peril. Um, and um, I was, uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, one of the people who I think has kind of captured this duality, I found with the most kind of, kind of in the most generous and I think sophisticated ways, Edward Said, you know, who, who, who writes in his book, The Question of Palestine, the absolute wrong of settler colonialism, here he's talking about Zionism, is very much diluted and perhaps even dissipated when it is a fervently believed in Jewish survival that uses settler colonialism to straighten out its own destiny. Um, I guess I say that by way of, um, of thinking about what I mean by one state, um, which is that I think of this as a binational state, um, a state that would need to have um, democracy for all of its citizens and, and a strong and strong protection um, even for minority rights. Yusuf has written, I think, very compellingly about that, among many other things, about the importance of, of, a, of a strong Supreme Court and, and a Bill of Rights, but also a state that would allow each of these two people, each of these two nations, to express their national autonomy um, within, a, within a single political framework. Um, I, um, I, I think that there is a one state reality now, and there was a time certainly that I, for, in which I believe that partition, um, which would have ended Israel's occupation over Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, could have been the beginning, um, a step forward towards a default resolution. Um, it, would, it would have left serious problems unresolved. For instance, Israel's own internal transformation that would have been necessary to, for its own Palestinian citizen population. Um, and it would, have it, would have, it would have not solved the refugee problem and would have needed to find ways of ultimately doing that. But whether that could have been in some alternative universe, um, a first step, I think is now moot because the, the Israeli project of entrenching its control in the West Bank um, and East Jerusalem is now far too deeply entrenched. Um, and so I think that it makes the most sense to try to imagine one political entity, whether it's a federation that provides kind of autonomy within one political space or even a confederation in which you basically have two separate entities that pool a lot of their, a lot of their um, uh, features of sovereignty in the way that countries in the EU do, for instance. Um, I think it would, that is, that responds to the one state reality we have now, um, responds, as you said, rightly said, to the need for Palestinian refugees to have a right of return, um, and responds to the need of both peoples to have safety and freedom in this territory. I think that, that in reality, I think it is probably fair to say that binational states are difficult. Um, um, that um, when you have, this would not be a country that had a strong overarching identity in its early years. In that way, it would be different than South Africa, let's say, where you had a strong overarching South African identity, even in the midst of kind of brutal racial oppression and, 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 and fighting. You would, this would be a state that would start out, it seems to me, with a very thin, overarching national identity and very, very strong in a sub-national sub Jewish and Palestinian identity. But I do think that the history, that what you see 
in binational states and divided society is that those that offer everyone a voice, as, as equal a voice as possible in government, are ultimately more stable and more peaceful. And that for all of you know, my friends that, uh, you know, and, and others who say Israel cannot become a binational state, um, Israel-Palestine already is a binational state. Um, and it, it seems to be very, very little prospect that that would change. So the real question seems to me is not whether binational states are difficult, they are difficult, but whether binational states work better for all of their people when everyone has the right to be represented in their government and live and live equally under the law. And I think that would be the case in Israel Palestine. Okay, thank you both. Um, Peter, let me um, explore a little bit with you um, some of the ways in which um, uh, the sort of a, a Jewish ethics, um, especially um, your reference to tikkun, to the uh, the uh, moral, spiritual, ethical work of repair, um, how that would apply. And so let me ask it this way. I, I noticed in your Jewish Currents essay on the one state, you say that the real tikkun is equality, a Jewish home that is also a Palestinian home, that this project involves an end to dehumanizing Palestinians, casting them as Nazis and compulsive Jew haters. I think those were specific words you use to talk about that dehumanization, and your hope that this may allow the Jewish people to free themselves from the trauma of the Holocaust, concluding that only Palestinian freedom can make Jews whole. Could you say more about this role of psychic um, healing and trust building in the work of building a state for all its citizens? Sure. You know, it may seem odd for me to talk about repair as it relates to Jews, since obviously Palestinians are the ones who are suffering um, so profoundly and whose uh, material and, and political and legal uh, and economic situation need such a massive tikkun, a massive repair. Um, but what I meant in that particular uh, sentence or sentences that you, that you quoted was um, that you know, that, that what I think needs uh, to happen for, for Jews is that, um, as, you know, as you know, and as most people who follow this know, that, that in Jewish discourse, the Holocaust and the creation of the State of Israel are, gener are very frequently twinned together. They are seen as a you know, kind of common narrative. That's part of the reason, I think, that, it, that the Palestinian narrative is so often willfully ignored and lost because the Palestinian narrative, of course, is a narrative of settler colonialism, which starts back in the late 19th century. But, but, but for G G the, the kind of common narrative of Jews is that essentially um, we, G Jews didn't have a country for 2,000 years. This culminated in the extermination of, of two thirds of the Jews of Europe. And then the creation of a state that was a tikkun, that was a repair for this trauma because it meant it would never happen again, because there would always be a Jewish army to ensure, right, that, 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 that there was never another Holocaust. Um, what I tried to suggest in the piece, and this is not original to me, many others have plowed this ground, but that in an ironic way, what the creation of the State of Israel and its policies have done is that in order to justify what Israel has done, uh, Jews have had to put Palestinians in the role of Nazi. Of course, needless to say, a deeply, deeply dehumanizing uh, uh, role, and one that, of course, then, then permits all kinds of terrible abuses. But essentially, for in this narrative, the Palestinians become the new Nazis, and Israel becomes the force that is keeping us from a second Holocaust at their hands. Now, sometimes the Iranians or others might come in and play a kind of a cameo role in this narrative. But in the long durée, it's really been, it's really been Palestinian. And so the notion of the Holocaust as the template for Jewish existence, that it is always 1938. Netan Menachem Begin spoke this way constantly. Benjamin Netanyahu speaks this way constantly, essentially requires the Palestinians to be in this Nazi role. And the Palestinians can never just prove this, right, unless they are actually given freedom, right? Because as long as you're holding them down, 
the, you always, the, the implication will always be, well, if you allowed them to actually have any political power or influence to express themselves, then they would reveal, the, then, they would, then they would reveal that the fact that they just want to kill Jews, right? So in a way, this narrative can only ultimately be, be moved past when there is Palestinian equality and when the obviously, you know, wildly misguided notion that Palestinians are Nazis, that, Pal that the essence of Palestinian political identity is the desire to kill Jews simply because that's what Palestinians like to do, is that's what I mean by the idea of a tikkun, that, that, that it is ultimately Palestinian equality that I think will explode this narrative, which is built on trauma and has been fueled by political exploitation and has led to so much harm to Palestinians and has also, I think, led to Jews in a certain point of way not being able to move on. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to frame a question to you, Youssef, now, and then I'd like to have some time for you all to interact with each other, and then we'll open it up to other questions from the participants. And I guess, Youssef, um, I'd like to uh, ask you to explore a little bit more with us um, your statements in your um, article in Foreign Affairs on the One State, where you say, um, that that we you, there needs to be a truth and reconciliation process focused on restorative justice as part of the work of building the one state um, and um, building political partnerships between groups that have been damaged and estranged because of the de very dehumanization that Peter's been talking about and it exists on the other side as well. Um, so could you say a little bit about that? Um, what you envision by the truth and reconciliation process as it would work in this context, and also the um, notion of restorative justice as part of that work. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Mark, for this for this question. I really appreciate it, and you know, I think uh, it's 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 an opportunity to kind of um, uh, develop a little bit on 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 what Peter. Um, said in regards to you know the 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 way he sort of hears um settler colonialism and and the um you know the yes but or the yes and uh response to that um you know i the, the reason why i think it is it it is important to see things through this frame is not because i am looking to uh negate or think it is necessary to negate in any way Jewish connection to the land. Um, I don't think that is necessary. I don't think that is helpful. Um, and I don't think that is right. Um, at the same time, I don't think it is right to ignore what the reality of settler colonialism has meant for Palestinians, continues to mean for Palestinians. And I don't think we can move forward without an honest reckoning about that uh, and at the same time, a, a genuine effort to try to approximate as much justice as possible for the implications of those processes, right? Um, so we could come to an agreement today about the reality on the ground and say, look, two states is not going to work. One state is the only alternative at this point let's think about a way that we can draw up a constitution um, that would allow for um, power sharing and minority rights and um, equal protection um, and uh, you know, all, all, all of these good and important things that, that need to be in any new construction that comes forward, any new political construction that comes forward. Um, but I think we would be making a terrible mistake and not really addressing the problem if we leave it at that, right? Uh, because there is real harm that was done to people over these years that continues to have a lasting impact in their lives today, right? When you're talking about nearly two thirds of the native population of Palestine being, uh, 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 you know, depopulated from their homes and denied repatriation for generations. What does that do to families? You know, what does that do to families um, uh, emotionally, psychologically, economically, 
right? How do we deal with that? How do we reverse that? How do we restore that? I think those are very important conversations that we, we have to have. And it begins by first having an honest reckoning about history. You know, not, not by saying, you know, 2000 years ago, was there a Jewish state? Was there not a Jewish state? No, but let's, let's talk about the people who are living here today, going to live as part of this future entity, right? How can we get as close to justice for them as possible, right? Um, you know, no constitution alone is going to do that. There needs to be a, a process of trying to make people and communities and towns and villages whole again, right? Um, for there not just to be peace on paper, for there not just to be a, a system that is drawn up to guarantee rights, but also a sense of justice among the people that live there. And that, and this is, we cannot approach this as zero sum. We cannot approach this as if there is some form of, um, you know, uh, support given to justice, given to repatriation, reparation given to Palestinians, that somehow that has to negate something, right, from uh, Israelis or from Jewish citizens or, 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 or so on. That does not have to be the case, right? Um, in fact, it, it would not be just if that, if that is the case. The idea here is to um, look at ways, and I point in, in that article to the truth and reconciliation as, as a possible way of doing that. And, and I, I just want to be clear that there are definitely strengths and weaknesses to that approach. And there are plenty of people who, who um, you know, know, know the, the history of South Africa and Rwanda and elsewhere where these sort of processes and commissions have been tried that can that can go on for much longer than me about the strengths and weaknesses of those things. But we need to find a way to honestly reckon with the history, the recent history, the impact that it's had on the people that are still around today, and how we can put processes in place, bring us as close to justice for those historical wrongs as possible. Not by denying anything that uh, it, it, it should be given to anybody else, but by reinstating what was taken from those it was taken from. Peter, would you like to respond to that? I, I'd like to have some interchange between the two of you now. Well, you both made uh, general statements about one state as, uh, as it fits into your ways of looking at these issues and gone into a little depth on um, the meaning of tikkun in your context and then the truth and reconciliation and restorative justice notion. What are some questions you would have for each other um, to look at common ground and also distinctive emphases? Um, it's for me? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I, um, I uh, agree with what you just said. I mean, I think that um, uh, we are having the beginnings of some kind of conversation or have been in the last year or two in the United States about a historical reckoning um, with, um, with the founding of the United States. Um, and that I think one of the um, points that um, many of the central actors in that effort have made is the deep interconnectedness between the past and the present. Um, and um, and that's why that's why people respond have responded so vociferously to the 1619 project, right? Because they recognize that it's not just a series of arguments about theoretical things about what happened in the 17th and 18th century. It has profound implications for what kind of country the United States is going to be today. And I think that's exactly that's the case in Israel Palestine as well. Um, and um, that. Uh, uh, so I, 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 entire, I entirely agree with that. And I think that um, it's, uh, it requires, um, uh, you know, what's interesting is that um, it's now uh, almost 30 years since Israeli historians, you know, Palestinian historians had done some of this work earlier, but they didn't have access to Israeli archives. 
it's been about 30 years now since Israeli historians, not all of them super left wing, by the way, um, uh, particularly Benny Morris, of course, um, started finding in the Israeli and the British archives um, the, the evidence that, that justified what people like Walid, Walid Khalidi and others had been saying about what actually happened in 1948. Um, and in a way, it's quite depressing to me, actually, that 30 years later, um, that, um, that that historical research by Israeli historians, um, you know, you don't even need to read Palestinian historians in order to understand a lot of this stuff, although of course you should, um, uh, um, that that hasn't percolated um, into the public discourse, uh, the Jewish discourse in either in Israel or in the United States, or when it does, I think the most significant moment in which it has that I can think about was, was in Ari Shavit's book, you know, where he makes this, I think, it's a kind of remarkable move that he makes when you think about it, and in certain kind of way quite shrewd. I think he, he, he basically says, the only way that I can make a conversation about the Nakba palatable in a mainstream kind of Jewish environment is to describe it and then justify it, right? Um, um, and essentially that becomes the, I think, the, the one moment that I can really think of where there's an actually kind of breaking through of that. But of course, that's deeply, deeply, pro deeply problematic. Um, and, and so I, it's just, it's a sign to me of, of how far we, unfortunately, at least in my community, we are from the reckoning that I think Yusef is talking about, which is a reckoning, um, I think De Desmond Tutu talked about in South African case, the Truth of Reconciliation Commission as opening wounds so they don't fester, right? Opening wounds so then you can be begin to cleanse and heal them, right? And, and not just so you can know the history, but you can actually do something about it, right? And, 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 and you know, which gets into things like Israeli land law, very deep rooted things about the state and the way it was created um, that, would, um, that would be very, that would take very fundamental work to, to start to, to undo. Anyway, so that's, um, that's not a question, sorry, but it's just a, it's a kind of a meditation on some of the things that you said. Okay. Yousef, uh, anything you'd like to say in, in regard to that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's, um, there's any doubt uh, about what Peter says about sort of the direction that uh, Israelis have moved. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's kind of, striking how um you know we are we are starting to see um sort of very different movement here in the united states right which um is itself a settler colonial country um and has its own um uh, very dark and very horrific history um which we all living here in the united states are still um, affected by, benefiting from, perhaps, uh, or harmed by, right? Um, and we are starting, thanks to, uh, you know, uh, many, you know, uh, younger generation activists and also very co uh, committed older generation activists who have been leading the way for many years, starting to have a different conversation about um, what our history here in the United States really was, what it's meant over the years, and how it's shaped our present. Um, and I, I think, you know, as I, as I think about how much of a different direction, um, you know, Israel has, has gone in, and, um, you know, I will we'll just share with you, I've, you know, I've done, um, I've done my own research in um, Israeli military archives, uh, in the Haganah archives. Um, and, you know, it's not, for, for a generation of Israelis, for an older generation of Israelis, um, none of this is really a secret, uh, particularly the generation of Israelis that, um, you know, fought in the military in 1948. Um, many of them know exactly what happened. Uh, they participated in what was taking place on the ground. Uh, and some of them came to um, rationalize it in their own ways. Um, some of them perhaps remain traumatized by it. Um, but a younger generation of Israelis has been sort of 
taught to justify it in completely different ways. Um, and some of what Peter has mentioned uh, earlier about the vilification of Palestinians uh, enabling uh, pretty much, um, you know, what uh, anything, uh, any, any sort of violence towards them. Uh, when, you, when you think that Benjamin Netanyahu, for example, um, only a few years ago, uh, attempted to uh, blame the final solution, Hitler's final solution, on a Palestinian. You know, um, that that is the ex the extent to which the uh, you know really disturbing revision of of, of history is being taken um, to justify sort of this this unending iron wall solution uh, for uh, the Israeli relationship to Palestinians. Um, so. But as I think of the, the, what is happening here in the United States, I do, I do see hope. Um, I, see, I see hope from that. Um, one, because it shows me that um, that kind of change is possible, um, but also because of the importance of the United States in this equation. Uh, and I think this is something that I know there are questions that are coming in in this, in this chat, and many of them are, are forward-facing questions about what can we do and so on and so forth. You know, for, for me, one of the most inspiring uh, things is seeing how the, uh, the change in the conversation in the United States about our own history um, is uh, starting to bleed into other conversations uh, and uh, including not just about America's own history with racism and colonialism, but also the role of colonialism around the world, uh, the role of European colonialism, the importance of um, thinking critically about history, uh, not just here, but, but in other places. And I think that that is a, that is a cultural shift that uh, portends, I think, very well for the kind of change that needs to happen here in the United States for us to get to a point where the United States can be a more helpful player in moving Israelis and Palestinians in the right direction. Peter, anything more on that? Any response from? Um, no, I, I, I agree. I guess I'll just pick up where Yusuf left off. Um, in the longer run, um, I, 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 it's not intellectually coherent. Um, to essentially embrace the, the kind of currents of political discourse that are taking place in either the race in the United States and then basically have a kind of see no evil position on Israel. But it is, I think, significant that that is actually what a lot of mainstream American, established American Jewish organizations are trying to do. It's only the far right ones, like Zionist Organization for America, which basically say, you know, we hate Black Lives Matter, you know, that, you know, it's all lefty garbage, right? The, the, it, which that's also what you, that would be a more discourse you hear more in Israel. But it, it is really significant that, that, and it speaks to the power of the discourse in terms of what's happening in the US, that, that so many establishment politicians and organizations essentially have embraced a certain kind of line of discourse without, I think, but that line of discourse is ultimately deeply destabilizing to the kind of arguments that they're trying to have with Israel and Palestine. Now, just because something is intellectually incoherent doesn't mean it can't endure, right? I mean, politics is about power, probably more than it is about intellectual co coherence. But I do think that, I think one of the things that could change this discourse is that, it, you know, right now the Israel-Palestine discourse in the United States is kind of a niche discourse, right? It's it's dominated by a relative, in, 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 in kind of high profile media, it's dominated by a relatively small number of people. Most of them are Jewish. Um, um, and, it's, and, and there are many, many, many writers who write on issues, all other kinds of issues in the United States, right? Racial justice issues, all kinds of other justice issues in the United States who just stay away from this, issue, right? It, it, because it's not their niche. Maybe they feel afraid of the conversation, Maybe they feel like it requires some expertise that they don't have. I think if they actually realize, they would real, they, it doesn't require an expertise that they don't have. All it requires is actually for them to apply their own values in a straightforward way. 
Um, and I think that if more of those folks, right? I mean, let's say Tana Hussey Coates decided to write on this topic, right? Or Nicole Hannah Jones, right? I mean, when Michelle Alexander wrote about it, it was significant, even though it was only one op-ed, right? When that, when it becomes less of a niche issue um, on, in the left, on the left, uh, in the progress in progressive circles, you know, then I think when F more people at MSNBC feel comfortable essentially just applying the things they say about the United States to this, that I think will produce a, a, a significant shift. Hey, let me uh, shift to a couple of the questions that have come in from our participants. Um, here's one that maybe gets us a little bit more to uh, political uh, realities in this country. This one uh, says the biggest problem to a just resolution is the U.S. Uh, unqualified support for the right-wing Zionists, which denies Palestinian rights altogether. If the U.S. changes its position to support a one-state Israel, Israel may, be, may, may follow or be forced to follow, how can we make the USA see the light? So there's a question here about um, uh, political transformation of this unqualified support from our government um, and the, the, the current right-wing government in, um, in Israel. What would you all say about that? Maybe I'll... Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bora. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that the United States uh, is not going to do the right thing here unless <laughs> it is uh, forced to do the right thing. Uh, and and that, that, that doesn't only go for Israel-Palestine policy, but I think it goes for foreign policy uh, more uh, generally. Um, you know, we should keep in mind that, um, you know, was, was an American administration uh, that was, uh, you know, willing to um, you know, go against even its own Congress to continue supporting uh, South Africa in the late, uh, up until the late 1980s, right? Um, so, um, you know, it, it will take a movement, it will take a, um, a, a significant effort um, to, uh, to move U.S. policy. Um, and I think it will take an effort here in the United States and also on the ground in Israel-Palestine. There are, and there are all kinds of missing components on the ground in Israel-Palestine that we haven't even started to, to talk about yet, which are also important. Um, but, I, but what I do want to say is that when it, when it comes to this question of one state or, or two, what I think is powerful about the one state vision is that it actually creates far better conditions for movement building for mobilizing people, particularly here in the United States, uh, than does the uh, two-state frame. Um, the reality is that um, you know, most people here in the United States don't really know a whole lot about Israel-Palestine, let alone know, you know what side of what village or, or what settlement a particular line should be drawn to, right? Um, but they understand the message of equal rights. They understand the importance of equality before the law. They understand the wrongness of ethnic-based discrimination, racism, and so on, right? Uh, and, and these are all messages and mobilizers within a single state equal rights frame that could bring in a much larger swath of people uh, than the, you know, um, the traditional conversation which has been limited to the niche spaces that, that Peter mentioned. Um, so in, in the big picture, uh, it, it is going to take a movement, but I do think that um, within this frame, we have a better chance of creating the kind of movement that will lead to change than anything else, particularly here in the United States. Peter, would you like to comment on that question about what it will take to uh, move the US in its politics more toward what you all are talking about? Uh, sorry. First of all, um, I, I, I do think that it's, it's hard for me to imagine that movement reading, reaching critical mass in the United States unless there's substantial change on the ground. I mean, there obviously any analogy is problematic, but to go to the South Africa analogy, um, you know, the, the, the anti-apartheid movement would not have grown around the world in the way it did in the 1980s 
had the, you know, the UDF, the United Democratic Front, which was essentially the ANC's proxy inside the country, had a, 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 a massive campaign um, um, that at, at tremendous cost to Black South Africans um, to raise the cost internally. Um, and, and, and to force the issue onto the front pages um, around the world and, and to make people and, and, and to bring the images to light that then drove the moral outrage around the world. I would say, just say in all honesty, one of the really difficult things about engaging in this conversation as a non-Palestinian, right, is I can't, I'm, it's not for me to advise the Palestinian national movement, right? Um, uh, you know, and it's also, it's not, you know, I, Palestinians can say things about their own movement. It's not really for me to start saying, you know, this person is collaboration, is this person is not. But essentially, if, Palest if Palestinian leadership on the ground uh, seems to basically be facilitating their, uh, uh, this pro the system of oppression, I think that that limits um, what can happen here or anywhere else around the world, partly just because it keeps things quiet and it keeps it off the front page if nothing else. Um, um, in terms of um, what can happen here, I mean, I agree with you, what Yusuf said. I, I do think, um, you know, one challenge, there are a couple of challenges. Of course, the, the anti-apartheid movement was significant part of it was led by the Congressional Black Caucus um, and by African Americans um, who had, for obvious reasons, a, a, a particular connection to what was happening. Um, um, so the, I think one of the critical questions, it seems to I mean, all people should, and many people do care, right? But it does seem to me there's going to be, there's going to be a way in which Palestinian and Arab and maybe Muslim Americans have a particular connection to the plight of Palestinians. And so one critical question I think is going to be, are they allowed to develop as a community in the way that other, you know, if these are communities that are largely come to the United States in the last generation or two? Right, not entirely, but largely, and so we're, would naturally go through, I think, a kind of natural process where a, a generation, the first generation born in the United States, will feel more comfortable, essentially, a, playing the political game and becoming more politically articulate and influential. Right, um, but I think a critical question will be: Is that allowed to happen in the United States? Right, or does you know be, this obviously this process I think has been retarded by. September 11th and its legacy, right? I think we would be further along in this process had not we had not the kind of wave of Islamophobia that was that that was that 9/11 helped to justify. And so I think that's a really really critical question, right? I think it's really, why it's really important that Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar won re-election, but there's still very very few folks like that. And frankly, I think even my sense is even some folks who do come from that community basically would, if they want to get ahead politically, feel like this, the safest way would be just to keep their head down. So I think that's one kind of really, that's one critical question for us to ask about this. Um, and the other is also just that, um, you know, I think one other difference between America in the 1980s and America now is that America internally is in such horrific shape right, um, with such profound, profound questions of our own society that I do worry that that may limit the activist bandwidth for people who would otherwise be focusing on Israel-Palestine in some of the ways that they focused on, let's say, South Africa, or for that matter, Central America, let's say, in the 1980s. Um, that's a good segue to another question here, which deals specifically with electoral issues. Um, it says, uh, recognizing the need to vote, especially in this election, but deploring the Democratic uh, National Committee and Biden-Harris campaign's failure to address continued military aid and support of Israel's apartheid colonization, how can we more effectively use our electoral power? And I would just say, I, I remember um, hearing that um, when the, um, spokesman for the Biden-Harris campaign essentially threw Linda Sarsour under the bus and dis distanced the, the Biden-Harris campaign from her, that when there was pushback from the Palestinian and the Muslim American community, uh, one of the things that came out was, you know, we have an important voting block in Michigan, which is an important state, and we'd like to be taken seriously and respected not only for our rights as Palestinians and the brilliant organizing work that Linda Sarsour has done, 
um, but also for the political power that we are that we are demonstrating. And it was interesting that that seemed to um, change the discussion a bit from what I, I could tell. So um, either one of you um, feel free to pick up on either aspect of that, but the question about how to use our electoral power more more effectively. Yeah, I, well, just uh, just one bit that relates to this on what something that Peter said. I, I look, you know, I uh, I understand the the awkwardness of trying to, to have this uh, conversation here or talk about this this subject as a non non Palestinian, um, and the reality is, you know, the the sort of the Palestinian house has uh, uh, there's there's a lot that needs to get in order, and there's no there's no short of conversation about that among Palestinians. I can assure you. Um, and um, you probably heard plenty of it uh, as well. Um, we're, we're pr pretty well aware of the shortcomings of uh, the leadership and know that that is an obstacle. Um, all of that being said, you know, as people having this conversation in the United States, uh, and as people who are also Americans and taxpayers and talking to taxpayers in the United States, um, the, the, the absence of a um, really effective uh, Palestinian force on the ground to campaign for change should not prevent us from asking what we can do to at least address the complicity of our own government in ongoing human rights abuses on the ground. And so I think that's while I, while I agree with you that there, there, there needs to be a catalyst on the ground, a Palestinian catalyst on the ground um, to get behind a political effort like this, and there isn't one right now, and there's a whole host of reasons why, um, that, that is not a reason for us to not have the other part of this conversation, which we need to have. And I think that's where our focus needs to be, um, right now. Uh, and I think this question, um, you know, is, is an opportunity to think about that a little bit. You know, uh, I, I know that there's uh, plenty to be frustrated about personally. I've had a lot of frustrations about some of the things that I've seen coming out of, um, you know, the Biden campaign, particularly, um, you know, what was done around Linda Sarsour and um, some, uh, some other things. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I won't, won't even get into a conversation about the problems with, with the Trump administration and the Republican Party and all, all of what, what uh, they have done and said about uh, Arabs and Muslims and Palestinians and so on. Um, but I do think there has been a tremendous amount of progress. And, and the last place that you are going to see progress um, is at the top of the ticket. Uh, what is so encouraging to me is the, um, the, the, the changes that you're starting to see bubble up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for people who are thinking about how can we get involved, first of all, there's a lot of different people to vote for other than president. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote for president. Um, you obviously should, should you know, do what you think is right. Um, but there are, there are a lot of offices uh, in, in our government at various levels, and there are a lot of ways for people to get involved, um, you know, at their municipal level, at their state level, and so on. Um, so, you know, uh, electoral politics is obviously much, much bigger uh, than just the presidential ticket. Uh, and also keep in mind that, you know, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that American policy uh, is what it is and has been stuck that way for so long. And, and we, we see uh, the, the forces at the top of these parties so hesitant to move away from this, this orthodoxy is because there have been communities of people and interest groups who have been doing this work in a committed way for a very, very, very long time. Um, and it's going to take a uh, similarly committed effort over time to create that change. And it's not going to start at the top of the ticket, right? It's going to, it's going to start by, uh, getting your, um, your, your friends and your allies and your partners, uh, elected to the school boards and uh, elected to the city councils and start their political careers, um, with the right values and with the right friends and with the right supporters, the right politics, and build upwards uh, from there. So, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I say that to be realistic. I don't say that to discourage anybody, uh, but that, I think that's the, that's the way that change, if change is gonna happen in this country, that's the way it, it, it will happen. And I will, will just offer you this um, uh, to, to conclude in response. 
when when there is a sort of um, uh, paradigm shifting moment in American politics on this issue, uh, it's probably not going to come when we expect it. Uh, and it's very hard to uh, tell how close um, critical mass really is on transformational change. Um, so I think the, the, the answer is to continue to get involved and to continue pushing um, and, and ultimately there, there will be change. Peter, here's a, here's a question that came in. Um, I'd, I'd be curious about your take on it. Let me just read it. Um, this is a American Jewish context. Uh, when we Jews realize the horrible error of our ways and admit we were wrong and we ask forgiveness and we ask all Palestinian refugee families to return to their homes and villages and we pledge to rebuild their, their homes and villages together and the Palestinians agree, and there is a democratic state for all its citizens, and the economy is better, and there is peace, and the tourist economy is stronger than ever, and everyone is sharing in the bounty. He asks, will we Jews be satisfied with that? What, what, do, you, what do you think? It, 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 what, seems to, what I hear in that is a kind of a, a mourning um, over a lost nationalism, um, over perhaps the Greater Israel Project. Um, what do you think about how um, Israeli Jews will respond uh, in the, the rosiest of scenarios around a one state? Do you think that most Jews would be in Israel would be uh, partners and, and um, in, in that project? How many would, I, I've heard some people suggest um, it would be a, a step to a bridge too far for many Israeli Jews and they might immigrate um, rather than share the space with uh, Palestinians. What, what's your sense about this? I mean, it's so speculative. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, but I, I, there's something I love about the idea of basically, you know, this, anyway, the question is something, there's something lovely about the question in a way. I mean, I, yes. I, I think that, um, look, um, that, um, there, I think there is a very, even in the most optimistic scenario in terms of, let's say, the kind of most peaceful process uh, and most kind of, um, you know, the process the, the, of, of, of fundamental transformation, um, you still have, you're, gonna, you're still going to have to, Israeli Jews are still going to have to kind of reckon with the fact that they have been Living in a certain in a way that that's based on them dominating resources and provide and allowing very few resources for the Palestinians that live alongside them, and that will change life for Israeli Jews, even in the most optimistic of scenarios. Um, and um, uh, and so I think there is a question under those circumstances of whether Israeli how many Israeli Jews might decide, you know, that they would rather go if to the degree that they could to go live, you know, in Canada or Australia or, or whoever. And it's interesting, I was just, I did a conversation recently with a fairly prominent kind of liberal Zionist Israeli. And she said, quite frankly, she said to me, and I've heard other Israelis say this, basically, I, I came to live in a Jewish, I came to this part of the world to live in a Jewish state, to live in a Jewish majority. If that doesn't exist, I don't need to be here. Um, um, and in, in a funny way, I think that is almost built into some of the Jewish conversation and anxiety, right? Essentially, that this is going to be another Arab country, right? Well, well, you know, the, the, the numerically it's going to tip. Well, if it's going to, it might that might be a self fulfilling prophecy, right? If a lot of Israeli Jews leave, I, I, it's it's really difficult to know. I mean, in the most optimistic scenario, I think you would find that there would be Israeli Jews who found a, a different way of actually connecting to living in the Middle East, you know, rather than the kind of the oppositional kind of what a Barack's, you know, kind of villa in a jungle way, right? And in a way, you might say that the most natural population to do that and to, to be a bridge to do that would be Mizrahi Jews, right, who come from the Middle East. You know, there's, um, uh, in a way, they're the fact that they 
have not served as a bridge, but in fact have become a kind of right-wing political force in Israel is one of the most tragic kind of developments that's taken place in this conflict. And you know, if you, the common discourse that you will find among many, in many kind of Mizrahi Jewish communities is, well, of course, because you know, we, we know what the Arabs are like, so we have no illusions about them, right? But of course, but, but I actually think the more compelling, if you, if you try to, and you know, my own grandmother who was born in Egypt would say things like that. And yet I think if you dig underneath the surface, and then, you know, um, I think Rachel Shabi in her book, We Look Like the Enemy, does a really good job of, of this, you know, is actually what you see is essentially the need to reject your own Arabness in order to be accepted by, by the Jewish state, you know, especially in the 1950s, you know, when it was even more Ashkenazi dominated, and even more racist towards Mizrahi Jews uh, than it is today. And um, so maybe that might be a community um, that could, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, I, I, I rem, you know, I, I, I um, anyway, I, th that might be perhaps a beginning but, uh, of, of some of this bridge building. I also think that Palestinian citizens of Israel are a critical force in this, right? They, in some ways, I think, are the bridge community um, because they have, not just because they have Israeli citizenship, but because they speak Hebrew generally and because they're deeply familiar with Israeli society, even, even if they have a, a, a very hostile view towards it, they understand it intimately. Um, and I think it's why a lot of the most, the most in, I think, interesting and impressive political leadership uh, in this conflict is right now coming from the political, elected political leaders, in, uh, the Palestinian political leaders inside Israel. Um, here's a question um, about Adala Justice uh, released a poll today showing a majority of Democrats are willing to reduce aid to Israel because of its treatment of Palestinians. How can we use such information to influence democratic policy um, given uh, the Biden Harris's and Congress's majority of Congress's resistance um, to this? Um, I guess it's sort of the disjunction between shifts in the political discourse and what's reflected at the representative level in Congress. Either one of you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I uh, there's a lot I want to say about the the, the last question, um, but maybe go I'm, ahead. That's I, fine. No, go ahead. I, th I think because uh, <laughs> we could we could go on for a while about that. But I also <laughs> thought I also thought it was fascinating, um, but. I, 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 I think this question is important too. Look, um, the, the, we've been seeing a number of these, these polls uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and I, I do think they're really important. I think they're indicative of a, a shift in attitudes in the United States. I don't think we should uh, underestimate the significance of that. Uh, they've, they've tended to coincide with this uh, broader um, uh, partisan uh, divide in attitudes around Israel-Palestine. Um, there's a whole host of uh, reasons for that uh, that I think um, are, are many decades old. Um, but I think the, 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 the question was how can we use this, you know, to kind of influence our, our uh, elected representatives. You know, um, the sad reality is that in, in, in this country, at least I think it's sad, the, the, the vast, vast, overwhelming majority of Americans, upwards of 90% of people think that there needs to be some sort of common sense uh, gun control uh, reform, gun reform, right? Background checks, what have you, right? We hear it discussed all the time. And despite that, um, despite this overwhelming consensus, uh, little change happens. And that's because the reality of the matter is um, in American politics, interest groups uh, matter a lot. And, um, you know, I think that uh, it's important for people to uh, not just rely on these tectonic shifts, which I do think are important and are going to help change come sooner than later, um, uh, but to also be organized in a focused way. And I want to applaud the work that, that um, uh, you know, uh, the, the VJP group is, uh, is, is doing um, and getting organized within your community. And I know that that's, that's not new and you guys have 
can engage with your representatives and are looking to, to grow and, and so on. But, uh, you know, it, it, that I think is more effective, walking into a member of Congress's office uh, or, or a local representative's office um, with uh, four or five constituents or four or five donors or what have you uh, will probably get you a lot further than what a particular poll might say. But that poll might help that member of Congress realize that, you know, the, the, the winds are starting to shift and this is not as, um, this is not as politically third rail as uh, it once was. And there are so many things that we can point to beyond polls to show that one only needs to look at, you know, the uh, results of recent primary elections to understand that, um, you know, things are not not what they used to be when it comes to, um, you know, Israel politics in this country. Okay. Mark, is it Jared? You're on mute, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, you're muted, Mark. There. All right, got it. Here we go. Thank you. Sorry. Um, critics of the one state say that it plays right into the Israeli right wing by undermining the effort to end the occupation and appears to give legitimacy to the settlement and annexation projects. Um, what, what do you all, how would you respond to that? Um, and another question is raised, uh, would do the speakers support annexation as a way to get to the one state. Um, we, we, we've said that the, it's already a de facto one state, but to get to the place where it's more de jure, more out in the open um, sovereignty, and then move uh, through a civil rights struggle toward greater equality for all the citizens. Uh, basically, it's how do you see annexation uh, in relation to the one state? Whichever one of you wants to tackle that one first is fine. I mean, look, I would say, um, I understand the argument that says, bring annexation on, right? It, 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 it dispels the myth. Um, um, I guess there are two, I have two anxieties about that argument. Um, the first is that I do think an, an, annexation does produce an additional level of harm beyond the harm that exists now, right? As, as, as difficult as the life is for Palestinians in area, in area C, for instance, now, or Palestinian, that, that, one, that annexation will essentially, I think, uh, in, in just exacerbate the, the tremendous difficulties in movement. It will in exacerbate even more land expropriation. Yes, these things are happening anyway, but I think it will exacerbate those things. Now, the argument for doing them would be, well, yes, but there will be this political backlash to annexation, which will, which will allow the movement for change to gain greater strength. Maybe, but, you know, I have to say, I mean, we, we did go through this summer where we kind of saw what American politics, and for that matter, European politics, would look like on the cusp of annexation. And what did we get? We mostly got, you know, we got some letters from Democratic senators saying, please, Democratic members of Congress saying, please don't do it, right? It wasn't, I mean, I think it was actually, frankly, pretty depressing. I mean, it did not spur, really, um, a significant number of people who were not already in support of conditioning aid or, or, or some form of sanctions to take that position. I think, basically, it was a kind of rhetorical opposition and a kind of, a, frankly, a collective shrug. So. Um, so I, I guess those would be my, be my thoughts about annexation. Youssef, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the reasons, Peter, why uh, we didn't see too much response is because to, well, a lot of people don't want to say that they know that, that, you know, the trains already left the station on two states. Mm -hmm. uh, between them and themselves, they know that that's the case. Uh, it's just not... Um, it's just not uh, politically possible to say or do much about that yet. And obviously we're missing a, a Palestinian component on the ground that's ready to push for that. Um, but you know, the reality of annexation is um, it already exists on the ground. It has for a very, very long time. Um, Israel's control over the territory is only deepening. 
Um, and, you know, what I would say to, um, you know, the, the initial question you asked about, you know, does one state legitimize the settlement and so on and so forth? Um, no, I don't, I don't think anything will legitimize the settlements. The settlements continue to be violations of international law. They continue to be violations of, of the Geneva Conventions. And international law doesn't disappear just because one shifts to a different paradigm. Um, I think that um, it, it remains important and they remain wrong. And I would also point to the fact that, um, you know, uh, nothing has done more to um, accelerate uh, Israeli settlement expansion uh, than the, um, the, the diplomacy around the two-state framework. Um, and it was, in fact, after um, the PLO's recognition of, of the uh, Israeli state uh, and the beginning of the Oslo process that we saw uh, the single most significant period of settlement expansion um, in, uh, in post-67 history. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think what has happened uh, because of that is that the Israelis have got the message, uh, is that the more we take and lay claim to, the more the Palestinians will eventually recognize, uh, and they will... Um, have their state maybe one day on an ever shrinking piece of land. Um, and if they don't like it, they can, you know, move to Jordan or whatever else is, is, is you know, in, in, in their minds. Um, but uh, I, I, I think actually that that, that two state approach has done more um, to uh, set Palestinians back uh, than, than anything else. It seems obvious that if uh, U.S. politics um, will ever respond to the notion of a one state, it's going to have to be because of the changes that exist uh, or come to exist on the ground in Palestine, Israel. So there are a couple questions about that. Um, in a one state vision, what changes would have to take place in the military, the prison system, distribution of water, land, economic health, and other social resources in political representation and laws on the books, all of which have act to cement Israeli apartheid. So there's, this is kind of the, the more pragmatic question of, okay, so we're talking about a one state and it's no longer just a theoretical vision or a, a hope for the future, but it be, it, it's as it functions as a practical political reality um, you know, would, would you, would, would the, the project begin to identify each of the 60-some-odd um, law, discriminatory laws and start to dismantle those one at a time? Um, you know, Adala, the uh, legal center for the Arab uh, uh, minority rights in Israel, has identified a democratic uh, constitution, sort of a model for that. Um, what are the, the practical steps that uh, activists on the ground, Palestinian and the few Israeli activists who might join this project, what are the, what could they set their sights on in pragmatic terms to begin to start um, moving the needle? Or is that premature? I, I think that um, one thing that I, I would hope for would be um, that you could see the emergence of a kind of genuine Jewish Palestinian left inside yeah. Israeli politics. Um, mm -hmm. um, the, obviously, the kind of Jewish left is pretty much, you know, not non-existent at this point. And um, and the and the joint list um, is first of all kind of locked out of of being considered part of the co of Israel's coalition governments. Um, and, and has made some strides in gaining more Jewish support, but still, I think, um, has a long way to go. And, and I think um, uh, for, it to, for, it to, for, for it to be, um, for essentially, you know, for it to, even for it to kind of win over most of the people who have been voting for merits, you know, in recent years, for instance, right? Um, uh, let alone those who are voting for labor. And I, I think that's, that's difficult work for a lot of reasons. I mean, it's not an easy bridge to, to, to it's not an easy political um, movement to create. Um, but I do think that would be the political movement that would, I think, be a force for tremendous 
change and, and hope and the work that would happen inside that movement and the relationships that would be built, I think would be really truly crucial. And I think in Ayman Oda and others, you have a leadership of that movement that has, I, I think, you know, reached out to Jewish voters and to Jewish Israelis in really dramatic and powerful ways that I think could be reciprocated and I would hope we reciprocate it. And I, and I, I think one potential, you know, thing, I mentioned this in my piece and I, it's controversial, I, I know, but would be essentially also to think about what, how this might play out at the municipal level um, in cities that have mixed populations, you know, um, uh, Haifa would be, would be one for instance, but then there's also the question of whether you would, if, if you do, if you do see a movement towards a one state paradigm, does that lead more Palestinians in East Jerusalem to reconsider their boycotting of the municipal elections um, in Jerusalem? And if there was to be some reconsidering of that boycotting, could you have uh, uh, Jerusalem as offering a kind of a, a model for, for politics that, that allowed the creation of coalitions that don't really exist in Israel today, where you might have the election of a mayor of Jerusalem elected in part based on Palestinian as well as Jewish votes, for instance, um, that could be a model for the country as a whole. So those are some things that I think perhaps could be stepped forward. Youssef, what do you think about that sort of more pragmatic steps and, and also in response to what Peter said regarding the joint list or new political coalitions forming? Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is, um, this is a really important question. It's a big, big question. Um, and, you know, um, there are variations of this that we hear all the time. You know, what does, what does the military look like? What will the government structure be? Does it have a name? Does it have a flag? What's going to be the national anthem? Is it going to have a national bird? You know, all, all of this, all of this good stuff, right? Um, I, I think that um, I certainly have my views as, uh, as an individual and someone who studies politics on what I personally think um, might make the most sense for a, a, a stable and just, uh, uh, you know, Israel-Palestine. Um, but the reality is that, that whatever it's going to be is going to, be ha going to have to be something that, is, uh, that involves uh, a broad cross-section of uh, stakeholders uh, among Israelis and Palestinians uh, at the generative stages of creating that. I think there are some elements of the Israeli political system that make sense to maintain, but also a lot that got to go. You know, I, I, I think it's important that, you know, you have a representative parliament or a representative, you know, a representative body and a lawmaking body uh, and an independent judiciary. Um, I think there's, you know, questions about the independence and representation, obviously, of those institutions in Israel. But those elements, I think, are important. A lot of other things, I think, um, you know, are, are, are deeply, deeply problematic. Um, but again, you know, we can, we can talk about drawing up that constitution, uh, but I really want to emphasize that that's, you know, a step in creating one state, but it doesn't go nearly as far as we need to go to get to a solution. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that involves really looking at a lot of different processes that have started playing out from before 1948 and after. Peter mentioned just one of them. When you talk about, you know, land, for example, uh, there's an entire system that was developed in, in Israel for taking and, and controlling uh, and dispensing land from Palestinians to uh, and for the, 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 the use of uh, Israeli Jews that, um, is, is something that absolutely has to change, you know? Um, and there, there are, are many other resources and many other systems built around dominating resources that need, that, that need to be changed. So it's a, it's a really, really big question. All of this is to say that I think at the fundamental level, um, it needs to be guided by core principles. And I talk about some of these principles in the, in the piece that I wrote in Foreign Affairs but I think, you know, the, the, the most important ones are equality before the law uh, and this uh, idea of co-permanence, uh, that uh, there is a shared recognition uh, between both communities um, that their belonging is not the negation of the other communities belonging in this space, right? 
uh, that is really important. And I think, um, you know, uh, there are going to be lots of difficult political questions that follow after that. Um, but I think a lot becomes possible um, if we can build around uh, those principles. Hey, um, the uh, 8.30 hour is upon us. Uh, there's been a couple of suggestions in the chat that we see if the speakers would be willing to extend for a few more minutes. There's still many questions there. Um, another 10 minutes or so, are you all game for that? Is that all right? Uh, okay. <laughs> all right, Yousef is okay for you, with you? All right, let's, let's go a few more minutes. Um, uh, here's a comment. Um, Dr. Munair highlighted the right of return. What does he think of Abu Sita's demographics con claiming, claiming that there is room for refugees to return without displacing anyone who lives there now? Um, just that whole question of the, how, how would uh, the right of return uh, work in practice? Well, look, I, there's, there's, a, there's a short and long answer to, to, to this question, but I will just tell you that the way, the way that people who deal with the, the, the question of the right of return in a two-state framework is they say, well, you know, that question will be resolved within the Palestinian state, right, which is 22% of Palestine. So if there's space for them in 22% of Palestine, I'm sure there's space for 8% of Palestine, right? So um, uh, I, that, that's the short answer. The long answer is, there's been a lot of really, really, really important work done on the practical implementation of repatriation. Uh, and I would encourage people to look at that. There's no way I can do it justice now. But the vast majority of Palestinian which in towns and villages from which Palestinian refugees uh, were depopulated remain empty today. Um, and so, you know, I think that is an important starting point. I think most people don't um, really realize that. Um, and, you know, I think people can check out the, um, the Deal Resource Center, uh, which the, has done really, really important work on this. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Salman Abusita has also done some very important work uh, on this. Um, and I think it, it's, it's important for people to begin uh, imagining not just what uh, return can, can look like, but also how, um, how it can become economically sustainable as well. Uh, because this is not just about the re return of people to specific places, but also the creation of communities, the recreation of, of uh, communities. And uh, we have to think about how um, economically and politically um, that all becomes integrated uh, into, into the country. Here's another one. Um, do you think, as does scholar Joseph Mossad, that political Zionism was founded on the basis of anti-Semitism? Uh, is that for me or? Uh, yeah, why don't you take uh, that one, Peter? Um, I, I think that um, there, we were clearly anti-Semites who um, were enamored with the Zionist idea um, because they uh, liked the idea of Jews leaving their countries and going somewhere else, right? Uh, I think Yusuf has written about Arthur Balfour, who you know supported the 1905 Aliens Act in Britain, which basically you know prevented Eastern European Jews from coming to Britain. I think the Zionist movement was probably was also also benefited in a, in a kind of an odd way, I think, from certain anti-Semitic stereotypes about Jewish power, which led um, some European and American statesmen to believe that somehow if they got on the right side of the Jews, they, you know, that would be very important for them because the Jews were so powerful politically and economically. I think people like Chaim Weitzman kind of played on those anti-Semitic stereotypes quite kind of effectively. Um, it's also true that the Zionism itself um, obviously took a dim view of the kind of what they would have called the kind of Jewish diaspora personality, right? That partly what Zionism was, a, was about doing was essentially to say, you know, Jews have become in diaspora, Jews are, you know, uh, an urban, effete, cosmopolitan, 
deracinated population, weak, um, and we want to reinvent what it means to be a Jew, right? So there were ways in which this language drew on certain anti-Semitic stereotypes about Jews, but I don't think it would be fair to call those Jewish Zionists uh, essentially anti-Semites. They, they just wanted a kind of radical sh shift in the Jewish condition. Um, uh, and um, so again, some of it because I think of, um, uh, you know, and, and some of it was because of an understandable fear that, that, um, that, that Jews were in um, grave danger, you know, um, uh, in, in, you know, in Europe as the, you know, um, and, and that in fact turned out to be the case. So anyway, I, so I think that there were anti-Semitic, there were ways in which anti-Semitism, anti-Semites and anti-Semitic tropes and Zionist tropes and people kind of locked arms, but I don't think I would, certainly I don't think I would say that I think anti-Semitism was in any way the essence of Zionism. Um, here's one more question. Um, again, taking us back to um, sort of the depth of um, um, rage and frustration among the, in the Palestinian streets, someone says, would an intensified intifada help move a one state human rights resolution and who would its Palestinian leaders be? So again, um, a movement away, I guess, from um, political partnerships toward a one state, um, pragmatic long-term multi-generational change to the role of the intifada or a third intifada in all of this. Uh, what do you all think about that? Uh, Youssef, you want to tackle that first? Well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what's intended by the the question. What's intended by um, the the use of the term? Um, but I can tell you, I I, I do think that um, for there to be real change on the ground, um, there will have to be some kind of broad-based uh, Palestinian mobilization. Um, in, and and at the end of the day, that's what an intifada is, an intifada is a, um, uh, a broad uh, uprising. Um, and there are people who want to uh, characterize that in a way that necessitates violence or militancy. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that that's the case at all. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when one looks through Palestinian history, there have been many moments where there have been national uh, uprisings including in the 1930s uh, and in the 1980s and so on. Um, and uh, I think, you know, they have been at their most uh, effective um, when they have been uh, broad-based, popular, uh, nonviolent demonstrations um, and, and civil disobedience. Um, and I think there is, um, you know, a, a much bigger conversation to be had about uh, this, but um, it's it's hard to see how real change happens uh, without broad mobilization among uh, Palestinians in a way that makes clear that the that that the message is uh, for um, you know with, with within a rights based frame um, and for a uh, an outcome a share an outcome of shared uh, you know shared homeland and justice. Uh, for uh, Israelis and Palestinians alike. Okay. Um, we're going to need to stop the questions at this point uh, with the with the the the, the hopeful note that um, we are going to be able to record all of the the chats, and we're going to try to get back to you as best we can with the the wonderful questions that have come in. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to frame them. Uh, and if you've had a chance to look at them as they've been going along, there's some great questions there. Um, so just the last couple of minutes, just some closing thoughts from each of you about um, the most important next steps that we as individuals can take um, in, uh, in, in our personal um, activism, uh, personal commitment to justice, uh, also our work with organizations, our um, intersectional work with uh, around Black Lives Matter activism, 
um, a, a host of issues that interconnect. Uh, what are your thoughts about um, sort of hopeful, inspiring, uh, concrete steps that individuals who care about justice in Palestine uh, and here could take? Just your thoughts about next steps for the, for the audience members. Peter, why don't you go first on that one, and then Yusuf, if you could close us out, that'd be great. You're on mute, Peter. Muted, Peter. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, I, I think um, I think one of the things that um, the kind of establishment Jewish organizations like APAC do extremely effectively, and of course it helps, they have a lot of resources, but um, is they take a ton of people on trips to the region. Um, and um, I, um, and, you know, and I, I think that when people go for themselves, they, they come away with a sense of confidence to discuss the issue, right? Um, um, and I think that happens whether you go on an APAC trip, which gives you the kind of Israeli government narrative, um, but it also, it happens if you go and actually go on a trip that actually, where you actually interact with Palestinians in a serious way and you actually see for yourself. And I think that, that to the degree that that could be, that those, that that could be scaled up among people who care about Palestinian rights, I think it would have a very significant impact. Um, um, it's not easy to do, obviously, um, for a variety of reasons, but I think it could have a huge impact. Um, I think in terms of um, on the ground in the United States, um, that the kind of bringing people together that, that you've done um, and, and that other local communities do is really, really critical. And I guess I would just say, maybe particularly to the Jewish members of this conversation who might be here, I think that your challenge our challenge, as I perceive it, is that you is to try to live in two worlds, um, which is to say, it is once one once one starts to actually start to engage in a in a community in which Palestinians exist, um, it all of a sudden becomes hard to be in many mainstream Jewish communities for a variety of reasons, and it often one can often become, frankly appalled, you know, um, uh, again, in the same way that maybe it's not some ways that, you know, someone who, you know, that the, 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 going back and forth can create a certain kind of schizophrenia um, of a certain, in a certain kind of way. And yet I think it's really, really crucial that Jews try to do that, which is to say, if you, in your work in creating a political coalition and community with Palestinians and others who care about Palestinian rights, essentially say, well, to heck, with the mainstream Jewish community and with those Jewish institutions, you lose your ability to actually influence them. Um, you lose your ability to try to be the bridge that allows them to go on that journey themselves. And I think that, so uh, I think that that's one thing that I think is really important for Jews who are involved in this work to do, is to try to stay inside those Jewish communities that need you to be the, the leverage point for other people to change rather than simply saying, you know, I, I want nothing more to do with these folks. Thank you. Yusuf? So I think there's a, there's a number of things that, um, that you could do. I, I think, you know, it's, 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 it starts with thinking about our own individual complicity in the situation. Uh, in, in our own community's complicity in the situation, uh, our own town, our own government's complicity in the situation, and ways in which we can begin um, addressing that. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think everyone knows that I've been a strong proponent of, um, you know, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, I, I continue to be. Um, and I do think that, you know, when we talk about some of the poll numbers that we mentioned earlier today about you know the number of people who are willing to support limiting aid to Israel, all of that. Um, I, I don't think that kind of change uh, would have been possible if not for uh, the efforts that have been going on for many years uh, at the um, you know community, local, church, university level um, to begin uh, addressing um, community and institutional complicity in the situation. 
Um, so boycott and divestment is a very important driver, I believe, of the possibility of sanctions one day being possible. Uh, and I think um, that work needs to continue. And I, I would encourage folks who are involved in it um, to, to continue to do so and those who are uh, BDS curious to find out more. Um, I would also say events like this are really important and I applaud you guys for uh, uh, doing it. Um, I, and I would also say, you know, um, this issue, I mean, for many people who may be on this call and often in these conversations, uh, this is a conversation among people for whom this is their issue. This is the most important issue for them. Um, they're Israel-Palestine people, and that's great. We, we obviously need people like that. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a justice issue. Um, and the, 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 the way forward has to involve building coalitions with like-minded people uh, who are not just Israel-Palestine people, but are justice people across the board. Uh, and that also means being a justice person across the board yourself uh, and showing up for other struggles and other communities uh, who God knows need, um, you know, uh, people to stand up and stand with uh, them as well. Um, so um, think about how to build and broaden uh, coalitions by uh, talking the talk and walking the walk alongside those who are struggling for uh, justice in their own communities. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. It's a good place to conclude. Um, <clears throat> I remember hearing recently from Angela Davis, a, a great um, mother of the, the, the black liberation struggle who, who said she's come to believe that freedom is not a state, but a process and a journey. And in that sense, we're always on the way toward greater freedom and, um, and not just for our own particular issue, but as we make bridges to um, our own communities and to other communities to do that, that important work. Um, thank you so much, uh, Peter and, and Youssef, for your contributions and your openness with each other and with all of us, your willingness to extend and, and uh, uh, extend the time to get a few more of these questions in. Uh, Sanjita, thanks for your, your logistical help in making this happen and to all of you for, for joining in. Um, You've made this an important event and uh, we hope to have many more in the future. Thanks so much to all of you for, for participating tonight. Uh, look for uh, final communications um, uh, through your emails. Um, uh, the uh, webinar offers some great features of follow-up. So we look forward to staying in touch. Thanks to all of you. And that concludes our, our webinar this evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.